YouTube! I thought that it would be an interesting idea to do a joint book review because Joe and I both just read Ready Player One by Ernest Cline. Will Wheaton does the audiobook and so I heard him talking about it because they did an event in Seattle and he was like, come, like years ago. Oh, damn. I know. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, he was like, yeah, for this new book, I did the audiobook for it, blah, blah. And I was confused, and I actually thought that Will Wheaton wrote it. <laughs> and so I, like, bought it, and then I was like, oh, who's Ernest Klein? Who's that guy? But, uh, it, it didn't matter, because the book was great. I was reading this book, and I was like, Joe, this book was written for you. It is 280 on Kindle right now. Buy it and read it. What are you doing? It turned out she was right. I really, really uh, love the world that this is, like, that's, Primarily, that's the primary attraction for me. Is mm -hmm. He's managed to like to marry like this kind of weird futuristic dystopia um, with this amazing sci-fi setting, and somehow also set it all in the '80s. Like it's so weird. I've consumed even just me personally. I've consumed a lot of media with the concept of like people go inside a video game. Like that is that is literally everything right now. <laughs> but this book managed to do some things that I hadn't seen before, you know, or or heard of or thought of. Totally. It was just like so many unique ideas for the way that they utilize this virtual society and world that were just so cool. That just made me like put the book down and just be like, ugh, I like kind of want to live in this world, but I also kind of fear this world. So for those of you who haven't read this book, the premise is that uh, it's it takes place in, what was it, 20... 2044? 2044, I, I believe. Uh, so really not that far into the future, 30 years into the future. There's this virtual world called the Oasis, and everyone just sort of spends their time in there. It started as a game, but it's become sort of much more than that. It's just sort of like the virtual world that people live in. Like, most people aren't even past level one because they don't care about that. They just want to, like, shop. And, like, yeah, it's, like, not about being a game anymore. It's, like, if you took World of Warcraft and then put, like, your mall and, like, Amazon.com and Netflix and, like, just everything you, that you spend all of your time you doing. You access it through World of Warcraft. Yeah. Yeah. Everything in there. And you log into World of Warcraft and then you go to history class because your school is online. Uh, what happens is, one day, the creator of this virtual world, James Halliday was his name, right? Mm -hmm. He dies and... This happens on like the first page. It's like this video is is released to the public saying that he has put an Easter egg in the game. It's got like a Willy Wonka vibe that if you find this Easter egg through a, a series of keys and gates that you win everything. You win like tons of money and you win the game and like everybody wants this. Yeah, I mean this guy is like a kind of Steve Jobs times a million bajillionaire mm -hmm. who is like... He basically owns the internet. Yeah, he owns the whole thing. Yeah. So he's like, and he's like, I'm not leaving any heirs except for the person who finds this Easter egg that I programmed into the game. This is like, people search... It becomes a lifestyle. Yeah, it's a lifestyle for people to hunt for this Easter egg. Yeah, they have names for them and forums and mm -hmm. people are in clans and stuff and there's all this politics on whether you should join a clan or not. So the, the book follows a specific egg hunter as he as he searches for this Easter egg. Or a Gunter. A Gunter. Egg hunter. Gunter. 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 I said Gunter. Gunter. We can... It's probably, it's, I mean, it's Gunter, but Gunter. It's <laughs> Gunter. So that's, that's the premise of the book. If it sounds exciting to you, you should definitely go read it. It's, I think it's probably still on sale on Kindle, if that's how you mm -hmm. like to consume books. If you haven't read the book, you should probably stop watching now because we're going to start spoiling things. And trust me, this is not a book that you want to have spoiled for you. Yeah. Go, go read it and then come back. And then come back put, and... Put this on pause. Yeah. And then read go the read the book. book. Yeah. And, and come back. Come right back. Hey, welcome back. You finished the book. Yay. So now we can talk more nitty gritty. What were some of your favorite parts about the book? Oh man. Ugh. <laughs> I broke Joe. Just everything was so good. This, this universe, this oasis that he put his world in made it feel like there were infinite possibilities. Oh, like God. you could just go to go to a planet, an entire like m the whole planet. You know what I love, I think the re I've been trying to like figure out what made this book so perfect, and I think it's because Ernest Klein is one of us. Like he 
he was raised during the time that video game, like he very obviously was a child of the video game revolution. He was there for every step of the way, and he's very much entrenched in the same nostalgic view of technology that we have growing up with the internet. And so this view, like this book's view of the future, is like sort of what we want. Yeah. You know, and there's obviously bad parts that we don't want. We don't want people living in stacks. We don't want you know, the world falling apart at the seams because everyone's too busy being in the oasis to, like, fix the world's problems. Mm -hmm. But being able to go to the Hogwarts <laughs> is what I want the future of the internet to be, you know? Yeah. And that's what's so perfect about this book, is that it takes these great ideas about what we can do with the internet, and it just they're exactly what people like us want. <laughs> yeah, it's exactly what you want, and it does a really, really good job of, like, maintaining that cognitive dissonance of, like, it's exactly what we want, and it kind of also seems really well predicted about, like, okay, if we get there, here's what we're paying with, because mm -hmm. we're not really paying attention to all of these problems that we already have. Are we going to like, descend that far into escapism and everything. It's yeah. just like, it's like, oh, I want to be in that, but oh. But also, ugh. it like, it felt so real too because the issues with the Sixers and IOI felt like such a commentary on net neutrality. Mm -hmm. You know, like, what what this main character is fighting for felt, like, just more extreme. I really love the idea, like, all of the stuff that they introduce as part of, uh, like, through IOI. Like, first of all, being in the Oasis and needing to have an army in yeah. the Oasis, like, actually having tanks yeah. and, like, all of this stuff. Just digital tanks yeah. because you need to defend your actual business with tanks. It was brilliant. Like, you think about the, like, corporate bullshit that we already deal with. Having that be, like, visualized with an actual, like, all-out battle yeah. was awesome. Also, going into the real world where they have things like they can put you under corporate arrest. Oh, like indentured servitude? Yeah. Because you owe money? Like, debt is literally go become a slave? Yeah. And, like, there's really not any way to get out of it? That scene, when when Parcival Wade, whatever, when he actually responds to the email from IOI, uh -huh. and he goes to see him, that was probably my favorite scene in the whole book, and he was saying, like, okay, like, I'll agree to do this, but uh, I want your job, and I want them to fire you. And then when he says, like, my superiors have said that they agree to your terms and I've been asked to like leave the premises immediately or whatever. And he was just like, nah, psych, I'm not, I would never do that, I hate you guys. <laughs> that was just like, he was just so cool. He was just such a cool guy in that moment and I just loved it. So this book was like perfect and I loved it, but I did have a couple of like small issues. So one of the things that bugged me was that I understand that the entire world has become obsessed with 80s culture because of Halliday and that there's been this huge resurgence, but what weirded me out was that there was absolutely zero mention of any sort of modern pop culture. And I understand that Wade just wouldn't be into it because he spent his whole, like, time since this contest was announced intensely researching 80s culture. But I feel like he would have at least... He could have at least been like, oh, uh, someone started playing that song from that new boy band that I don't have time to even care about. I just felt like there should have been some offhand mention, right. even about pop culture that he doesn't care about. But I feel like there was, there was a large chunk of time where the rest of the world had sort of forgotten and given up on the egg hunt. And so there should have been other movies and, and TV shows and pop stars and like other people famous for doing other things within Oasis, and we didn't see any of that. Right. He mentions that they exist. He mentions like you know, oh yeah, only movie stars can really afford to do that, like, things like that, so, like, there are still movies being made. There's I still actually happening. read that to be, like, movie stars that still happen to be alive from the time when 80s movies were being made. <laughs> because they even, like, the only people even that they mention in this world were, like, that old geezer Will Wheaton. Uh-huh, and Cory Doctorow. Which, which actually, like, really took me out of the story for a second, because I was like, I was like, did Ernest Cline just really name someone after Will Wheaton in this story and not expect it to? <laughs> oh, he's still alive. Right. It's, only, it's 30 only 30 years. years. I think if we had to vote president of the internet today, I think Will Wheaton would have a shot. I think, yeah, I think he'd be a really good kid. Him, him or Hank Green, I think, would probably be, oh, yeah. like, head to head. Or are they on the same ticket? Yeah. Oh, God, they'd be such a great duo. Uh-huh. Yeah. Wheat and Green, 2014. Yeah. <laughs> Another issue that I had was, I know that, like, the world has sort of devolved into ruins, but there were a couple of things that were said that I feel like the world would have progressed beyond in 30 years. So some of the things were, I know it was, like, young boys being dumb young boys, but they, like, they used the word faggot. 
I just really feel like we will have moved past that word. I'm not going to teach my kids that word. Right. And so when they're having kids and teaching their kids things, like, that word will be completely phased out. And I, I agree with that. Like, it, it took me out, too. I was like, n even now, like, if somebody says that word, we're like... Really? It's like, like, where did really? you grow up? Seriously. And the other thing was, uh, there was a point where they were making, like, some of the boys were making fun of uh, some of the other boys, and they referred to them as ladies. Mm -hmm. And that bothered me, too, because using ladies as a derogatory term to young boys is something that, again, I feel like is still an issue now, but will not be, like, we'll have new issues. Like, what I would have liked to see is noob being, like, a derogatory term. Or, like, <laughs> yeah. something like that. Like, something that has turned into a derogatory term that isn't a derogatory term right now. Because right. I just think 30 years is enough time for us to have different insults. When we other. start, like, realizing the cultural insensitivity of, like, d of demonizing people who are new. To yeah. That. <laughs> like, yeah! Like, I would have yeah. loved that. Who knows how well the uh, dark corners of the internet are even going to evolve in, over the next 30 that's years because they still haven't they that's still also haven't something gotten we that great see a lot of you know like oh yeah you know there wasn't like oh we don't go over there all the porns over there like they didn't really <laughs> like like oh half the world like this like the northern hemisphere of the oasis is obviously porn i think once you take a step down there you have to like start describing how the haptic suits work with like virtual sex. Oh no, he did do sex. that! He did do that! He bought that like doll for a little bit and then yeah, it was but just it like... Yeah, it was like actually a physical doll yeah. still though. Yeah. Which is still like... I, I know like it's that... gotta be there and I wish he had mentioned it, but I don't want to know. I like that they at least <laughs> introduced that for a second. Yeah. I like that like he was like, I did this, I decided I didn't want to be that person, I got rid of it. <laughs> I didn't figure out the thing about H until like right before. It was oh, like yeah. a page or two before, but it was like right around the time when she was like, uh, you know, you might be kind of shocked when you see my appearance. And in that moment, I was like, H is either a girl or an old guy. Uh huh. I thought that the H reveal, it was, it was cool and it was great. And I thought it ended up being a little bit too after school special with like, because yeah. it, like he walks in and she's not only like... She's not only a girl, and black, and but overweight, also overweight, and also gay. <laughs> she just, like, ticked all the boxes. Yeah, it's like, they're, great, there's representation, but it's, but then there's, I think there's literally a line in this book that it's like, well, why should it matter what your race, or gender, or orientation, or body type is, because <laughs> we're friends. It's like, okay, okay, yeah. I mean, I, I love it, and there's nothing wrong with it, it just felt a little bit Well, preachy. it just sort of felt like, because, you know, it's like, okay, like, these are all the issues. And she had all of them. <laughs> and so it, it almost felt like, like, what is the worst thing that you can be? Here's what I think it is. It's like, poverty was huge in this book. It was like the, the whole undercurrent of basically the entire thing. Mm -hmm. Everybody's going after this thing because it's money. Mm -hmm. And, like, nobody has that. Right. Whereas, like, suddenly at the very end in this one scene, like, we shoehorn in, oh yeah, also race and gender. Oh, and she was, she was, uh, kicked out of her home because she's gay, so there's that yeah. there, too. It was, like, very sudden and very, like, Oh, we gotta get that oh, in there! Yeah, they did it all. I really liked that H was mobile. Like, I liked that concept oh, that, was that cool. H had this RV that she, like, traveled around in. But I I did think it seemed a little odd that they basically, like, made her gay to give her mother a reason to not like her enough to kick her out of the house to have it make sense that a kid would be mobile. Yeah. <laughs> I totally knew that, like, when we knew where the gate was and they had barricaded it and everyone was coming, I was like, well... They did tell us about Chekhov's Catalyst a few <laughs> yeah. chapters before. Yeah. Obviously, if most of the Oasis is going to be in one spot at one time, and someone <laughs> mysteriously bought this bomb that'll blow up everyone in <laughs> one server at one time, what do you think's going to happen? Yeah, exactly. When he got the quarter, I kind of knew, because I had been looking. I was like, okay, the way this is going to work is that he, because he's working with all of these friends, there's no way he's going to betray them. No. So, like, he's going to be the one to survive this bomb. Yeah. And, like, how's that going to happen? So I was looking for that the whole time. Mm -hmm. And then he gets this quarter, which is obviously this artifact, other Easter egg. Yeah. And it's like, okay, so a quarter is an extra life. So I, I did get it then, but I thought, I thought that was just really well paced and yeah. well done. It wasn't just knowing like, the particular games for the hunt that were useful. Like, the fact that he was as good at Pac-Man as he was 
like, gave him a leg up because he had really studied everything. <laughs> you know, like, he was a master of everything, which also made it so that Halliday would know that he could trust him with this thing that he made, you know, because he cared and understood everything that Halliday, like, cared and understood. Right. I like that it tied together the usefulness of how much time he spent becoming a master at, like, everything Halliday ever loved. Uh-huh. Which felt crazy when he talked about how, like, how many times he'd watched... I was like, you know more about, like, the time period that, like, I grew up in than I do. Like, way more. <laughs> right. Way more. Right. So, I mean, like, we were just kind of toward the end of the 80s, yeah. too. We weren't teenagers in the 80s. Right. Most of the things that we grew up with were not in there, but, you know, I've, I've seen enough stuff from the 80s that I was able to pick up most of the references. Mm -hmm. The, the thing I really loved, and I've said this before, but the, like, all the different planets were, like, so interesting that you could just come up with, you know, this anti-gravity dance club, mm -hmm. you know? you anti-gravity dance club, like, full on, you just make up whatever planet you want, and that's really, like, that is what really captured my imagination for this setting in this book, and that's, like, anybody who's a gamer of any kind, I think, is really gonna love it. Another thing that I loved was how one of the one of the gates was being in the movie and having to like play out the movie and how Wade even realized while he was doing it Holiday invented another new game that he is only <laughs> revealing to us now and how he knew that this was going to become like the new craze because how I would do that I would I actually like put my book down for a second and I just imagined like what movies would I want to do that? Like, all of them. Like, God, could you imagine living through Harry Potter or, like, being Frodo? Or, right. Like, God, it would be so cool. Like, just so many things that were invented that I want. I haven't wanted a, a book to be turned into a movie this badly since Ender's Game. Oh, this is going to be such a good movie. Oh, so excited! So, that was Ready Player One. This is a long video, but there's a lot to say. Please let me know down in the comments below if you've read this book, what you thought of it, favorite parts, favorite quotes, whatever. Any last thoughts? No, I don't think so. Go go read it if you haven't. Yeah, I loved it. Okay, go check out Joe's channel if you want to see more videos that he has done. And thank you guys for watching. We will see you next time. Bye! Bye.